A very good morning to all of you, and it's wonderful to see all my dear friends here. And um, I do hope that as a gynecologist and practicing reproductive medicine today, I would be able to get the same passion into all of you that I have in my practice. Thank you very much, Dr. Usha, for having invited me. And uh, thank you all for being so kind to be here to listen to what I have to say today. Since the very beginning of history, the human race has placed a lot of emphasis on fertility. Even an overpopulated country like ours has fertility issues. It is the UN declaration that which affirmed that it is not that everybody has children, but everybody has a right to have at least one child. The WHO estimated that there are about 80 million couples all over the world currently having fertility issues. And when we look at our own country, the childlessness amongst Indian couples has gone up by 50% over the last 20 years, and 15% of women who do get, uh, get married have problems conceiving. Infertility, it is a disease because it sort of disturbs the mental peace, and that is what disease is all about. And it is called infertility when a couple is trying without any protection for over 12 months and have not achieved pregnancy. It is a medical disease. It is a stigmated social problem. And 50% of the women receiving infertility are the only ones who are lucky to get treatment for the same. Two out of three couples will eventually get pregnant with medication and treatment. Even when a woman is married, the first thing as she garlands her husband, the first choice that she has is he is going to be the father of my children. This is woman behavior. This was a picture I took when I was going to Madras in one of my trips, where this couple was taken to the so-called holy water to bless them so that they have children. So you can see how ingrained it is even before she enters her bedroom, She's taken for blessings to have a child. The mother-in-law, of course, is the most important person in my lecture because she's the one who created awareness because the only thing she would tell her son and, of course, her daughter-in-law would be, when are you going to have a baby? And this is the question that they dread. It's the first time that the man looks at his neighbor and realizes that he's doing the same thing but not having his child. The first person to treat infertility in our country is the astrologer because he asks them to perform certain rituals. And then when nothing happens, the mother-in-law lands up in our clinic. This is the usual scenario. She says, well, my daughter had no problem conceiving, but my daughter-in-law seems to have all the problems. So what is going to happen? If you do not help her, another woman is ready. The woman, on the other hand, comes with her mother and begs for a child. The next person and the last person to arrive is the husband. The only impression he gives us is do what you want but get her pregnant I am fed up if nothing happens at this stage the second wife usually the sister comes along with the husband for treatment because in this case the husband was azospermic but refused to get evaluated and of course, the next scenario is when both the wives are pregnant, and this is a couple who we treated both together, and they had twins each, so now they have four children at their doorstep. And all that was done was to evaluate the male. 
what did I learn? Do we nearly, do, is it really necessary to treat infertility? Why not leave it to nature? Because after all, adoption is an option. So today, Dr. Usha had asked me to speak on management and the rational approach to an infertile couple. I selected a basic topic because I think most of the clinics that have patients coming, 15% of them are going to have this problem. So I felt it was the best platform on which I could mention the rational approach to investigate an infertile couple the way we do it in the Institute. In planning this presentation, which is of half an hour, I divided it into the following. What should I know about basic reproduction? How does one logically, based on these facts, evaluate an infertile woman? What are the tests available? How do we do it in our institution? How do we categorize the patients once we have investigated them and outline a plan of action? The first question about basic reproduction, I always asked myself, why are human beings so infertile? When I looked at my dog, she made babies in just one sitting and she had so many of them and we are so concerned about hyperstimulation and multiple pregnancies while these animals without ICUs for babies are able to manage so many pups at one time. We must realize that human reproductive efficiency is very inefficient. Reproductive efficiency, if you look at in terms of pregnancy, normal exposure, normal couple, they have in one month a 20% chance of conceiving. There are many causes to an infertile woman for infertility, but when you put everything together, 35% is a female factor, 30% a male, 20 combined, and 15% still remain unexplained. So the first question we ask ourselves is what is the man's contribution to infertility? 400 years ago, when Dewan Koch first described the sperm under the microscope, he called them humunculus, which meant little man. His belief was that when you put this little man into the uterus, a child grows. That was the first concept of reproductive medicine. Today we know that the testis is the male gonad producing the sperm. The epididymis and the vas mature, store, and transport the sperm. Whilst the prostate, seminal vesicles, and the bulbourethral gland supply the seminal plasma, which contains the nutrition for the sperm. When you look at the testis, God really made a beautiful organ. It has 250 incomplete septa, in the testicular lobules. Each lobule has seminiferous tubules. In the tubules at places there are steroid producing cells which are the Leydig cells. The seminiferous tubules by itself has two types of cells. The sperm cells which are undergoing development and the Sertoli cells in which the sperms are forming in the testis. So it is a highly specialized gland. When you look at once the sperm is produced in the testis, the sperm passes through the seminiferous tubules, then into the epididymis, where maturation is happening, where the DNA in the sperm is maturing, and then it goes into the ejaculatory tract and before it goes ejaculation. This entire procedure is called one spermatogenic cycle, which is about 74 days. Then let's look at the sperm. The sperm is a highly sophisticated toolbox. When you look at the sperm, it is paddle shaped. It has a head with an outer membrane, and that is the acrosome cap. The DNA is here tightly packed in the head of the sperm. 
There is a centromere in the midpiece, which is very important in the development of the nuclear spindle. The tail contains the axoneme, which is a central axoneme, and when you look at a cut section, it has nine doublets of microtubules and a central doublet as well, which has dense fibrils which allow sperm movement. So you can understand that in one cell, there's so much happening. And this is for the attention of the men. In the last second, each man has produced 1,500 sperm cells, and that is the rate of sperm production. When you look at the sperm production, it starts at 10 to 12, uh, 12 to 13 years, continues throughout life, reduces, of course, with age. 85 million sperm are produced by each testis every day. So when you look at the number of sperm that are produced in the lifetime, it goes on to a quadrillion or more. When you look at endocrinology, the hypothalamus under the effect of the GnRH produces LH and FSH. The LH that is produced by the pituitary acts on these Leydig cells and produces testosterone. The FSH produced by the pituitary gland acts on the Sertoli cells and produces androgen binding protein, which has a high affinity to the testosterone and under the influence of testosterone androgen binding protein, spermatogenesis is happening. So you can see when you look at nature, it is so beautiful. Then let's look at what happens of the transport of the sperms. Once the sperms are ejaculated, the sperm forms, the semen forms an ejaculate, which is a coagulum, and this protects the sperm from the harsh vaginal acidic pH. In a few minutes, the sperm is released and the sperm then goes into the cervix. The cervical mucus now thins out during the time of ovulation to allow the sperm. Those sperm that are abnormal are discarded at this point. The normal sperm then goes and about thousands of sperm actually reach the fallopian tube. In the fallopian tube, the sperm has to go via the cilia, which are in the fallopian tube, which actually discard the bad sperm. The sperm ultimately now, with the process of chemotaxis, because it has been found that on the sperm surface, there are olfactory receptors, which actually smell their way to the egg. And this is exactly what happens. A few hundred sperm actually reach the egg. Now, looking at what happens, in the sperm, two things happen when it enters the genital tract. One is called capacitation, wherein certain enzymes are released, which allow the sperm to penetrate. Hyperactivation happens. The sperm starts moving at a very high speed and goes towards the egg. So whenever you feel really low, I tell myself, well, I was made from the sperm that was the quickest and the best. So I am worth something. My life is worth something. Now let's look at the egg. The egg, on the other hand, is, has very little specialization. It has a lot of cytoplasm because it has to nurture the embryo. When you look at a quick look at what happens in recruitment, there are primordial follicles. The primordial follicles become preantral follicles. It's important to tell you this because then we understand the investigations. The preantral follicles produce anti Mullerian hormones, which is a sign of ovarian reserve. The preantral follicles then become the antral follicles, which are selected and come into the gonadotropin-dependent phase, and then comes the mature follicles. So this is how recruitment happens. But when you look at a woman, when she is in her mother's womb, at the 
at 20th week of pregnancy, she has six million eggs. By the time she's born, one million are left. By the time she reaches puberty, 300,000 are left. And by the time she's 37 years old, 25,000 are left. That is the rate at which atresia is happening in nature. The egg, on the other hand, is developing within the follicle, a mature follicle. And this, with the LH surge, the ovulation happens and the follicle releases the egg at a very high pressure along with the cumulus cells. And then this is picked up by the fallopian tube and transported to the site of fertilization. When you look at the marvels of fertilization, that is the egg with the corona radiator. The sperm is now moving towards the egg. The sperm, because of capacitation from the acrosome cap, releases enzymes, which penetrates the first sperm that gets attached to the zona, penetrates the zona. It leaves its tail outside and then fuses with the ulema, which is the membrane. The ulema actually grasps the sperm and then engulfs the sperm. That is what happens to men when they are married. And then the ulema starts producing enzymes and cortical bodies, which prevent other sperms from entering the egg anymore. So you can understand how beautiful nature is. What is happening inside the egg, on the other hand? The sperm decondenses. The chromosomes start separating, and it forms now a male pronucleus. This is what happens to the sperm, decondensation and formation of the male pronucleus. The egg, on the other hand, is going through its final state of maturation and forming the female pronucleus. The, the next thing to happen is the formation of the nuclear spindle. Both the pronuclei are pulled together by this nuclear spindle, and the male and female nucleus now fuse to form the ultimate body, that is the human body, a child. The next thing that happens is differentiation of the embryo, so formed into a blastocyst, which then goes into the uterus to implant. Implantation is occurring in the endometrium, which is extremely fascinating. It has a short window of implantation during which the embryo implants, which is a few days. If the embryo arrives at this implantation window, implantation happens, otherwise it doesn't. And when you look at what is required for successful implantation, successful implantation depends on two factors. A good embryo, which reaches the uterus on time, and a receptive endometrium at a time when the blastocyst can allow implantation, and a synchronized dialogue between the embryo and the endometrium now happens. And that is where implantation happens. The trophoblast is formed, and this then eventually becomes a child that we were in our mother's womb. I want you to watch what nature is so beautiful. This is, uh, these are just the things that sort of pulled me into what reproductive medicine is. And after the child grows in the mother's womb, life kickstarts. If they are one too many, then this is exactly what happens. So let's go into the next phase of what life is all about. Today's evaluation on diagnostic evaluation of the infertile female is based on the ASRM guidelines, a committee opinion. The first question is, when do we evaluate the patient? We evaluate the patient if she has completed one year of married life and 
has not had any protection and is not conceived. If, however, the woman is more than 35 or has some definite signs to show that she has a definite medical problem, then you evaluate her early. No woman should be evaluated before 19 years of age of the girl. This is a very strict guideline by the Indian government. To evaluate the male, the only test that we really have is the semen test. We must realize that the sperm test only tells us very little. It is useful to say, is he possibly fertile? Probably fertile. But it doesn't tell you the functional ability of the sperm. And this is something that we must tell our patients. Just because a male has normal sperm profiles in the lab does not mean that he is fertile. There are other tests, but there is no test like the test of having his own child. Semen analysis assesses only the manufacture of the sperm, the transport of the sperm, and the ejaculation of the sperm. Of course, it is subjective, it should require strict criteria to analyze, but it is only a guideline to help the expert. It is important to tell your patient to abstain for not more than three days because you have patients who think they should abstain for a longer time, 10 days, to have very high sperm counts. This is wrong. Not more than three to five days, the time the collection should be in a container that is tested for toxic material. You can't collect sperm in just any container. I am just telling you the important points which are usually mistaken. So it should be a container that is tested. No plastic containers should be used. There are special containers available. In addition to this, he should bring the sperm for examination immediately or within 45 minutes of collection. He should not collect this in an ice chamber. We have many patients bringing sperm samples collected in ice containers. This should not be done. It should be brought at room temperature. The liquefaction, the viscosity, the pH is evaluated. You should look for agglutination, the sperm count, the sperm motility should be assessed progressive, non-progressive, and immotile. But the most important is the morphology, which is not tested, really. There is something called the strict criteria, which we should test. The WBC must be assessed. It must be remembered and told to our patients that the sperm profiles can vary every day in a male who is otherwise normal, just like the um, stock market, that's exactly how the sperm profiles look. Males usually believe that the best sperm count is the best lab, it's not so. I have to go a little faster because of the paucity of time. The sperm parameters that are of importance in terms of priority is sperm morphology, motility, and last is count. The WHO standards say that 15 million count is all that you want, 32% motility and only 4% normal forms by the strict criteria is a normally fertile male. In the morphology, the different types of abnormal morphology can be head defects, can be pin heads that you can see here, can be abnormal head absence of acrosome cap. This is called globalospermia. It could be mid-piece defects, and it could also be mixed defects. The sperm has DNA, and we look at the DNA by different assays, the comet assay, the tunnel assay, and the SCSA assay, which tells you whether there is any breaks in the DNA material, which is very important because if there are more than DNA fragmentation of more than 30, and you do an IUI for this patient, her pregnancy rate is going to be only 
so before an IUI is planned, particularly in male factor, the DNA fragmentation must be performed. Genetic testing is done only in certain individuals going in for ART, particularly males with counts less than 5 million or an azoospermic male. In azoospermic males, it is also important to look at cystic fibrosis and also test for anosmia, which may be a part of Kalman syndrome. Looking at this, the Y chromosome, a quick look. The Y chromosome has a short arm and in the long arm. In the long arm, you have three genes, the AZFA, B, and C. In azoospermia, C genes are deleted, but if you find a male who has deletions in A and B, you will never need to do a testicular biopsy because these men do not have sperm in their testes. In other words, if you see there is a micro deletion C, you can go ahead and do an ICSI for them, but if they have A and B deletions, they are sterile. You have to think of alternative options. Ultrasound is also done for exclusion of varicocele and obstructive azoospermia to see for seminal vesicle blocks. When a, sperm, when a sperm is evaluated at the end, it should contain the age and the name of the patient, the reason for referral, what was the summary of the workup, and what are the possibilities to improve sperm quality. And so we always tell our urologist and andrologist colleagues to mention this in their referral to us because this helps treatment. In the female, on the other hand, there are tests to look at the egg, that is the ovary, the uterus, and the tube. The protocol for an infertile people, person, how we do it, we take a detailed history, we examine, it, we examine the couple, we evaluate the male and the female partner together, we counsel them thereafter and plan their action. History taking is an extremely important part wherein you have to look at all aspects, the medical, the family, the reproductive, and the genetic aspects according to the guidelines that are available. Listen to the patients, they will give you your diagnosis. Physical examination should, should include the weight, the BMI, the waist hip ratio, the vitals, look for thyroid evaluation and an pelvic examination and evaluation of the adnexa as well. Diagnostic evaluation should take into account the couple's preference, their age, the duration of infertility, the features in the medical history and the clinical examination. Examination of the ovarian function, we must realize that 40% of ovarian dysfunction causes female infertility, so we need to evaluate them. Evaluation of the ovarian function is through the menstrual history, through the basal body temperature, serum progesterone, ovulation prediction kits. These three do not have any value, but can be done as baseline tests. Histological dating of the endometrium, of course, does not tell you very much. Monitoring of ovulation and evaluation of the hormones really gives you guidelines. Menstrual history, ovulatory women usually have regular cycles, but women with regular cycle does not mean that she has ovulation. A basal body temperature will only show you a biphasic chart because of the progesterone effect, there is a rise of temperature of a degree or so. A monophasic chart confirms an ovulation. Serum progesterone done in the mid-luteal phase of more than three indicates ovulation and a value more than 10 indicates a good luteal phase, but again, this is of no significance in terms of outcome. Prediction tests, that is the LH kits are done. They do not have any value except in the cycle they are performed. Dating of the endometrium by endometrial biopsy has no value except in the cycle used, and it is of value only when you suspect tuberculosis or infective pathology. Follicular sonography is the mainstay where you look at the follicle developing and the reflection of the endometrium on ultrasound. 
Evaluation of the thyroid status is extremely important, and if the thyroid is more, if the TSH values in the reproductive age group is more than 2.5, they must be considered subclinical hypothyroid and treated with very low doses. TPO antibodies are the only antibodies that must be done in these patients. Evaluation of the ovary on ultrasound should be done in all cases. You have to look and measure the volume of the ovary because the volume of the ovary per se will tell you the type of responder. For example, if the volume is less than three, she's a poor responder, and if it is more than nine, she's a hyper responder and has a tendency to hyperstimulation. Ovarian blood flow gives you a lead into the outcome. The antral follicle count is done by counting the number of antral follicles on the ovary. We did this with 3D ultrasound, with Sono AVC, and we can actually calculate, the machine calculates the number of follicles recruited in a cycle. We need to look at the relationship of the ovary to the surrounding viscera. For example, this patient had no ovary on this side, and when on laparoscopy, we realized that this ovary was actually had an undergone a torsion and was under the liver. So doing an abdominal ultrasound is very important in these patients, especially when you don't see an ovary on ultrasound transvaginal. You need to look at the ovary and understand it because that, a picture like this would indicate that she has ovarian additions, which you will see on laparoscopy. The ecotexture, you must know whether the ovary is normal. This is the normal ecotexture where you have stroma and antral follicles, and this is an ovary with a cyst. You have to see whether there is pathology inside the ovary, that is a cyst, or outside, that is a paraovarian cyst. You need to also look at if there is a mass. For example, you see a mass here. You look at the vascularity, and then you remove it with laparoscopy. If, on the other hand, in a cyst you see excrescences, you need to do a 3D, and that's the 3D picture. This was a borderline ovarian malignancy, and in this case, you need to do conservative surgery, particularly in the reproductive age group. From ultrasound, you can also see whether she's a polycystic ovaries, the number of antral follicles more than 10, the volume, the 12, the volume more than 10, the peripherally arranged follicles, and of course, the other features. You then need to evaluate the uterus. As earlier I told you, the uterus endometrial biopsy is of value only for infective pathology. You need to evaluate the serosa, the myometrium, the uterine cavity, the coronal end of the tube when you look at the uterus. A unicornate uterus is diagnosed on 3D ultrasound. This is a uterus with a rudimentary horn, and that is the rudimentary horn that we saw on ultrasound. This is a bicoordinate uterus. These are different shapes of the uterus. This is a uterus which was a didelphus uterus, and this is confirmed on laparoscopy, and this patient had one embryo in each of her uteri. This is a septate uterus. You need to evaluate myometrial lesions. They may be fibroids or adenomyosis. Intrauterine cavitary lesions, for example, here you see a cavitary lesion. On 3D ultrasound, you see a hyperechoic area. These are fetal bones. Polyps, and of course, this was a, a vicryl that was left after recanalization in a woman that we saw on ultrasound and confirmed it on hysteroscopy. Sonohistrography is also done. This is a way to look at structures within the cavity that you don't see on 2D ultrasound. By histosalpingogram also you can evaluate sinicae, didelphus uterus, but it is unnecessary exposure to radiation. Instead, we depend on ultrasound. Hysteroscopy is very important if a lesion is diagnosed because you can remove this lesion while you do a hysteroscopy and correct the pathology at once. Looking at the tubes, this can be evaluated by a histosalpingography, which means that you inject a catheter 
through a catheter, you inject radio-opaque dye into the uterine cavity and then evaluate this. This is a normal tube. These are normal tubes and spill. These are block tubes. And of course, this is a hydrosalpinx. This is a primary method of evaluation, but to avoid this, now we have Hyco C and 3D, where you can just inject uh, EcoVist, which is a contrast medium, without exposing a woman to radiation, and look at that. Laparoscopic evaluation is very important for peritoneal factors. And I have just one more minute during which I will tell you what we do with the treatment options. We evaluate whether it's a female factor based on, on the investigations we have performed. If it is an ovulatory dysfunction, we do ovulation induction. If it is a tubal factor, we correct it first with laparoscopy, and if it cannot be, we go for IVF. If it is endometriosis, we try IUI for one or two cycles, and if no pregnancy, go for an IVF. If male factor, there is only subfertility, and the DNA fragmentation is normal, you can go in for an IUI cycle. If it is more difficult male factor management, then you go in for an ICSI, which means that you inject the sperm into the egg in vitro and transfer the embryos. In unexplained infertility, we try IUI first with gonadotropins, and if it doesn't work, we go in for ART. So how do I end my talk? By saying that children belong to life and, to na and they are nature's answers to continue our species forever. We still need investigations till this is going to be our future of making babies through computers online. I could make this presentation because of the group I work with and this is only possible in a big team Infertility can never be treated alone, except when husband and wife do their jobs together. Thank you very much for your patient listening.